probably an understood thing to most of you if you uh, if you follow media at all anybody <laughs> if you follow media at all Facebook anything else um, there is a credibility crisis in the church and everybody was shocked And I, I kind of want to unpack that a little bit in respect to uh, this kind of plot line we're working through with, P, with Peter, um, the disciple, this week. I, I found this quote. It comes from a, uh, a book that I finished, uh, I don't know, a couple months ago. It's called From Strength to Strength, and, and it's a really interesting book. I'm going to quote uh, from the writer, and I've, I've forgotten his name all of a sudden. But... Here was the quote that caught me. It wasn't necessarily a Christian book at all. In fact, uh, I heard about it listening to sports talk radio. <laughs> but this is what was right in the middle of his book. He, he says this, um, Discussions of religion are fraught with mistrust because it often feels like someone is trying to sell you a Buick. to proselytize instead of giving questions and ideas fair and open treatment. So that kind of outlines some of our problem. And the, the church is, is famous kind of for saying, well, this is, this is where we're at, and if you want to join us, you can come through these doors and be a part. Um, and now, I'm not identifying this as being a good plan. I'm just saying this is kind of where we end up. And so if you want to follow us and join us, we'll stay here. You come in here. And if you come through those two doors, you kind of need to act, think, and even look like we do. That is a big part of what has created this um, credibility crisis. And so as kind of a an aftershock of that, um, what happens is, is the, the people look at the, at the Bible and as, and as Christians is kind of this fairy tale concept that people have aligned themselves with and it doesn't really make sense for today. Um, and I think quite honestly that one of our callings, and not just uh, me because I'm standing here today, but you guys too, one of our callings is, is just to say how the Bible is full of helpful information for today and it's written about really normal people just like we are. One of my favorite writers of all time, uh, and I'm reading this book for probably the third or fourth time at least, it's, uh, I started it a couple weeks ago, Come Share the Being. Uh, by Bob Benson. He, he writes this in context of what the Bible ought to communicate. He, he, it comes on the, uh, the tail end of him talking. You remember when you used to, uh, you probably still can, but when you could order for your kids, you, you would get a bunch of information about them, their, uh, their date of birth, uh, their favorite color, their favorite pet, all these kind of things, and you would send them in, and then they would send you a book, and the book was about them, right? Because it took all of the information that you had sent, and they plugged it into these critical places, and so when you read the book to your child, it was like, wow, somebody wrote a book about me, right? So he picks up with that concept. He says, we like stories about ourselves, but he's talking about the Bible here. And he says, and this living book of God is about us. Read it. The King James, the Revised Standard Version, the New English Bible, the Living Bible, in Greek or Hebrew or any of a dozen other translations, and you will find that he will be saying things to you that guide and comfort and bless and heal and answer the deep questions of your life. We are in that book. It is a me book and a you book. 
Now we have all taken our turn at saying, there's no room in this inn. And we all know what it is like to sadly reverse our paths like the rich young ruler. And we all know what it is to say, I don't know him. Or to leave unsaid, yes, I am a follower of his. We all have bravely said in stirring faith, and this is our passage today, thou art the Christ, the son of the living God. And we have all felt or said, unless I touch the prints of his hands. It is not a book written a long time ago about some people who lived way back then. It is about us. It is not just a book about a few men to whom he said, Lo, I will never leave you. It is to us as well that these words still speak. It was not only their sorrow that he promised to turn into joy, but he was saying to us as surely as if he were looking us in the face that the thing that seems like sorrow to us today, he would have us writing poems and singing songs about tomorrow. These things were said to us and for us and about us in this living book of God. Now, we all believe that, don't we? Haven't written anything that we wouldn't all nod our heads in agreement on, have I? Then why don't or why can't we act like this is the living word? Why do we say, I tried to read the Bible, but it's just dull? monotonous and routine. Maybe it is because we haven't realized that it is a me book and that he was not only speaking to Paul on the Damascus Road, but he was just as surely speaking to Patrick on Bayshore Drive. Patrick is his son. We should be able to hear God smiling and breathing and whispering and shouting and laughing and crying to us in his word. By the way, in my opinion anyway, that's why the book of Acts is, is so good to read. We'll get back to that after Easter because it's all about real people in real situations. So if you're here today and you heard what I just read um, or if you're online, and you heard, I just wish you would pass that on. We just have a couple weeks before Easter. Invite somebody to come and hear about the me book. You still have time. I'm going to ask you to stand. We're going to read together some of the scripture portion for today. We're starting here. This is... Matthew chapter 16 this week, we're starting with verse 13, and we're just going to read the opening phrase, and then I want to give you a little bit, and then we'll read a second portion, and then you can be seated. So just this opening descriptive concept here for verse 13, chapter 16, when Jesus came to the region of Caesarea Philippi, and I'm going to stop you right there for a second. Because I thought this was really interesting. Because when a lot of times when I read places, I'm just like, okay, that's a neat name. I don't have any idea. But uh, Ralph Earl in Beacon Bible Commentary said this. He said, this was a city built by Philip, son of Herod the Great, named Caesarea for the reigning emperor, Tiberius Caesar. It was designated further as Philippi to distinguish it from the Caesarea on the coast of the Mediterranean, built by Herod, and in Jesus' day, the seat of Roman government in Judea. The ancient Greek name of Caesarea Philippi had been Peneus, and this survives to its modern name, Beneus. It was located on a rocky terrace under the shadow of towering Mount Hermon, Hermon, I'm not sure, which is snow-capped the year round. And nearby, so put yourself in this space. This is in the moment that we're with Peter in this place and Jesus and the rest of the disciples in this place. Nearby are cliffs that still bear the marks of the ancient worship of the gods Baal and Pan. 
This was a fitting place to confess the deity and messiahship of Jesus. If all around you are these, is this setting that speaks to you of all the different gods that have been a part of time in this space. Ralph Earl says it's a good place for Jesus to begin this dialogue. Let's continue on. He asked his disciples, who do people say, let's read it together, who do people say the Son of Man is? And they replied, some say John the Baptist, others say Elijah, and still others Jeremiah or one of the prophets. But what about you, he asked, who do you say I am? Simon Peter answered, you are the Messiah, the Son of the living God. And Jesus replied, Blessed are you, Simon, son of Jonah, for this was not revealed to you by flesh and blood. You, you can sit down. I, I didn't tell Janelle that, but we're going to stop right there. That last verse, I, and we're going to read on in just a second here too, but if, if you have an underlinable context for your Bible this morning, Underline that statement in verse 17. This was not revealed to you by flesh and blood. I'm not going to go way deep into the, uh, the Greek, even though I have that stuff written down here. But what, what is being expressed here by Jesus to Peter is, you have had an opportunity to hear the answer to this <laughs> through the power of the Spirit. Wouldn't it be good <laughs> to have that be said about us on a regular basis? That didn't come to you through human thoughts and human understandings. The, the phrase that we have used that, that became really popular, and we still use it every once in a while, oh, it was such a God moment. And in essence, that's kind of what Jesus is saying there. But sometimes the God moment things that we read about on Facebook don't seem so spiritual to me. But this is. Jesus is saying this didn't come to you through any kind of studies in, in, that you have had and uh, all the things that you've learned about uh, growing up as a Jew. This has come to you well, his own words, revealed to you, not by flesh and blood. And he goes on, but the continuation of that verse is, but by the Father in heaven. And then he says, and I tell you, Peter, and on this rock I will build my church, and the gates of Hades will not overcome it. There is kind of this... Um, He's making a, a statement here about two different words that relate in our, in our English translation to stone or rock. He starts off um, by saying, you are Peter and on this rock. So Peter in the Greek, the word is Petros, and rock in the Greek is the word Petra. And so what he is, at least most commentaries believe this is what he's trying to communicate here is that Peter, the, the best translation, Peter or Petros means a stone. And on this rock, this foundational rock, I will build, this build my church. The idea that he's saying is that this truth, this uh, intervention of the Spirit of God, and Peter's response verbally to that is, you are the one. It is on this understanding that I'm going to build the church. And you will be a, a stone that is a part of that rock. Now what we have going on here is, like I said, in, incredibly powerful if we can grab a hold of it and understand that, remember last week when uh, the, the pivotal moment that we kind of looked at it that was in step with this wondering heart idea was this moment where Peter, they, they get off the boat and, and Peter is before Jesus and he falls at his knees and he hugs him and he says, away from me. You remember this quote? Away from me for I'm a sinful man. It's his realization 
that uh, in comparison, I, I, I was speaking with Richard <laughs> after the service, and he said, he said, in that moment, it's like, he said, it's like Peter saying, I'm dirt and you're all dressed in white. And so there is this chasm between him and Jesus and he realizes it. Now we fast forward into the story today and it's like, and we've talked about this before, there are these moments where, you know, Peter gets a gold star and this is one of them. You are the Messiah. You are the son of the living God. And this is the mountaintop experience that is the, the concept behind the subtext for our message today. And what Jesus is saying is that it's not, this is different. It's not like, uh, it's not like I, like I said, that he had arrived here through his previous education. It's not like uh, he has been able to understand. He knows all the math. Um, and that that mathematic understanding, first I learned, I learned uh, addition, or first I learned to count, <laughs> and then I learned addition, and then subtraction. Some of you are, you can raise your hand when I get beyond you. <laughs> I'm almost there. <laughs> I got to multiplication and then division, uh, Fractions, oh my. Algebra. And you keep, some of, some of you, you can say those words. <laughs> but you're like, if you're like me, you're like, that's it. Or, or spelling and grammar. Shift from math and go, you know, I, I started to learn where to put a, a, a comma. If you read anything I write, I use the three dots a lot. I don't know why, I, it just, there's not a real reason for that, I just like them. <laughs> so I'll put those in a lot of places. In fact, there's one in your outline. An ellipses, right? Yes. But what, what Jesus is saying is that there's nothing that, have, that you have worked process-driven worked on in your life to get to this place. Where you are is an anointed moment because you have listened to the Holy Spirit. And if, if, if I was going to stop any place today and just say, this is what we need to get, it would probably be right here. If we could come to a place as people where consistently... We didn't seek to have an answer that was produced through anything else, but we leaned on what God was going to give us as an answer. Man, I just think we'd be way better off. There's things that we would know and understand, not because, not because like I said, we'd studied about it, but because God had anointed that moment. And we prayed about several of those things already today. It's going to require God. This also reminds me that the concept of, that we have over here to my left, the belong, believe, become. When do you stop becoming? I know that's not a fair question. We don't, right? We don't. I remember as a, as a young Christian, I, was, I, I would have been confused about that because most things in life, it seemed like, you know, you graduate from stuff. You get your diploma. You, you, you get a driver's license. You, you arrive at this moment. And when I first began to understand, I was kind of annoyed <laughs> that there wasn't a moment where I was fully all the Christian that I needed to be. I'm, I'm still not fully. Anybody with me? And I, and I, and I think that part of what uh, we have to grab if we want to experience those moments where God anoints us with answers and with gifts that we don't expect is we have to come to the place where we go, I'm not fully there yet. Because if you think you are, <laughs> I just think he goes, well, you got all you need then. I'll let you keep moving with what you think is complete if that's what you want. 
I do have a bit more to give if you're interested. But you have to buy into this. I, I think this is kind of what uh, Paul was saying in Philippians chapter 2, verses 12 and 13, when he says, So then, my dear friends, just as you have always obeyed, not only in my presence, but even more in my absence, continue working out your salvation with awe and reverence. For the one bringing forth in you both the desire and the effort for the sake of his good pleasure is God. So we keep working together to try to find what God has for us. So this is a process we find Peter in a lot. Uh, as he's working through challenges in his own life, he, he has to have executive, I wrote down here, because uh, I think it's clever a little bit. He has to have consistent executive council meetings with me, myself, and I in order that he can sort through what is going on. Now, there is a word that is kind of familiar to us today in this process. Um, I was talking some with uh, our daughter and son-in-law just a, a few days ago. There is this phrase, it's called deconstructing our faith. And when we hear that in, in a lot of churches, we're like, oh, no. I'm going to give you a different slant on that today. Deconstruction, I, I mean, in, in a lot of ways, it's pretty literal if we understand what construction is, but it means tearing something down to a foundational beginning. I don't think that that's always bad. In fact, what I would suggest is that the church is working on that a lot over the last five years. And if we embrace that and invited people, like I said, not to come in through these doors or into the doors of our own home because they act, think, and look like we do, but instead said, come on in because we're de deconstructing together. We're trying to find our way back to the most simple concepts that Jesus can give us so we can find answers to life's questions. Amen. It's when we get really caught up in our well, you can fill in that blank, whatever you want to put there. When we get really caught up in stuff. So I'm going to give you some ideas here that would help us to not fear, but invite people into our own con uh, conversations that are deconstructed to a place where the ground is level. So that I don't come off as prideful. So I'm going to suggest some things to you. Deconstruction is okay, if, and I'm going to give you a couple things here really quick. There's a, again, this is that book I mentioned to you. Um, I think his name is Arthur Moore. That was what just came to my mind. That may not be true, but from strength to strength. And, and this was helpful to me because I'm so aware, you know, all the statistics historically say that if people don't find Jesus as Savior before what age? 18, that they are, it's, it's most likely not going to happen. I think the statistic is like 85%. I've lived with that. And, you know, as a youth pastor, I preach that. So we got to get them. Because as soon as they leave youth group, it's over. <laughs> but he wrote this, and I thought this was helpful. And this is helpful for all of us that are past 18 today. And have friends uh, who are over 18, Okay. He says the theologian James Fowler explained this pattern in his famous 1981 book, Stages of Faith. After studying hundreds of human subjects, Fowler observed that as young adults, many people are put off by ideas that seem arbitrary or morally retrograde, such as those surrounding sexuality. They may also become disillusioned by religion's inability to explain life's hardest puzzles. For example, the idea of a loving God in the face of a world full of suffering. But here's, the good, here's where the thing changes. He says, as they get older, however, people begin to recognize that nothing is tidy in life. <laughs> That's a nice way to say that, isn't it? This, according to Fowler, is when they become tolerant of religion's ambiguities and inconsistencies and start to see the beauty and the transcendence of faith and spirituality, either their own faith from childhood or some other. Folks, this is, to me, this is so inspiring. I have so many friends 
who have no idea how good God is. And so do you. And you can invite them uh, to service on Easter Sunday at what time? Or, (laughs) there we go. (laughs) I didn't have that written in, but it fits. But seriously, for a long time, I, I've, I've, I've felt, I think, at least that, man, if we don't get people before they're 18, that we're in real trouble. He goes on in the book to talk, he talks about this a lot, but he just says, we have a chance with people who have begun to see that life is not so tidy. And they're not necessarily going to run up to us and ask us to give us the answers. But if, if, we're going to, if we can stick with them and have conversations that also may not be so tidy, we have a chance for them to find Christ. So deconstruction is okay if two things, and I'm going to have to move through these much quicker than I have been. But the first one is this. It's okay if we know, and I'm sticking with the construction theme, if we know who holds the hammer. We need to be aware that when we seek to pull apart what has happened in our lives as it relates to faith, that there is an enemy who's looking for that moment, right? As somebody who maybe grew up in the church and and has said, I believe in Christ. So if we're going to deconstruct and then stayed in the church, folks, this is my kids. And have stayed in the church their whole lives. That when they start to do deconstruction, it's important to know the voices that are going into that dialogue. And if we can be a part, or if somebody that we, we know will speak some of the truth that we have aligned with our faith into that moment, it's going to be helpful. Because the enemy likes to take those moments, because I've been in this conversation a lot. And what the enemy, the words that the enemy brings into a deconstruction conversation is coercion. You were coerced when you were young. Manipulation. Man, folks manipulated you to thinking this way from the time you went to that first vacation Bible school. And you were never allowed to think on your own past that time. Another word I think the enemy likes to bring into that is regret. Don't you regret how you lived? So it's important for us to know who holds the hammer, who is involved in that deconstruction conversation. I I have a friend, Dr. Andre Sims, and he shared this at Better Together. Um, I can't even remember how he worked this into what we were talking about. But he said, you know, growing up, we always used to say, show me your friends and I'll show you your future. And that's why we said, you know, as parents, who are you going out with? And when will you be home? And what are you doing? And probably a few more questions. And those aren't bad, those aren't bad questions at all. But as I relate those things to this concept, we, we have to understand that these, these are worthwhile conversations for us to enter into But we also need to, and people that we love to enter into, but we also want to make sure that it's like there's some people from my team participating in the game. But vulnerable conversations are significant. Brene Brown, who you know I quote every once in a while, she's not a theologian, but she's doing some really good work in helping us to understand emotional and psychological battlefield that the church is going through right now, I think. And she wrote this. Vulnerability is the birthplace of love, belonging, joy, courage, empathy, and creativity. It is the source of hope, empathy, accountability, and authenticity. If we want greater clarity in our purpose or deeper and more meaningful spiritual lives, vulnerability is the path. I think that that's pretty true stuff. I mean, go to the beginning of that statement. It is vulnerability is the birthplace of love, belonging, joy, courage, empathy, creativity. Those are good Bible words. 
So if we can get into the process ourselves and not be afraid or not debate, it's going to be okay. Deconstruction is also okay if we know that Christ, and this is, makes complete sense, Christ is involved in the process. And here's the thing. We don't have to be embarrassed to inter, introduce him to the process. If you read through the scripture, in fact, one of my favorite questions to ask people when they're fed up with church is simply, but what are you going to do about Jesus? Right? Because, because the issues that they have with the church, when you get to start to talk to them about what Jesus said, and even better yet, what he did. <sighs> Compassion, hope, help. And not just the people who seemed to deserve it. See, that's one of the problems with the church sometimes is, is we're good at, at helping sometimes, but we, we kind of want to pick and choose who we help. And, and there's not a point in Scripture that, that I read any of the Gospels where he stops and says, you must be my disciple. Instead, he says, if anyone wants to be my disciple. Amen? So it's, a, it's, an inv it's totally an invitational thing. We talked a few weeks ago about the fact that grace waits. Behold, I stand at the door and knock. There's no forcing of anything there. Okay, so... We want for the, the Christ. And I put it that way instead of, instead of Christ or Jesus involved in the process because that relates to the revelation that Peter gave us, right? The Christ, the Messiah, the one that we have been waiting for. Can we believe, and this is the, uh, the next point there, can we believe that becoming is built on some wandering heart moments? Think about that for a second. In other words, becoming isn't all this kind of a trajectory that just steadily goes uphill. Because mine doesn't work that way. My, my spiritual trajectory, it, didn't, it wasn't like, yay, he got saved, and you know, straight to Jesus. And that's where he's remained ever since. That's not my story. It might be closer, in fact, I'm pretty sure that some of yours is closer to that than mine. But mine has some wandering heart moments. And, and if we can kind of become okay with that, that's going to help us in this conversation. We will get to these mountaintop experiences, the things that we just read about. But if we can say it's okay that becoming who God intended for us to become, is built on some wondering heart moments, then falling and found can stand together. At least closer than we've had them in the past. And to me, that is this, holding this tension between faith and doubt and saying, you know what, the, the doubt part not only does that not mean I'm, I'm unsaved, it doesn't mean that, dealing with doubt. It doesn't even mean I, I'm a terrible Christian. It just means I'm working through these moments. And, and God is working through them with me. You, you've heard this so many times, but it's, it's true, so I'm going to say it. What that does for us is it, if that's true for me individually, then this meeting place here is not a museum of saints. It's a hospital for what? Sinners. Or wanderers. Whatever we want to say. There was a young lady who came last night to uh, the Vibe worship night. And there was a handful of you guys that were here too. And I, I heard some who also said they wanted to come. I, I put a post up. Uh, I didn't stay till the end because I was gone almost the whole day. And so I left early. They started at 7. Uh, I left at 8.30, which was early. 
in the worship was great. And if you go to our Facebook page, you can see uh, some of the snippets from that. But as we were starting, there was this young lady who walked in. Um, I was going to say her name, but I won't. I hope she comes back. But she was looking for an Al-Anon meeting. She walked into the foyer, and she was bright and shiny, and she said, can you show me where the Al-Anon meeting is? And I said, I I think they went online and haven't come back to have uh, in-person meetings. And I could see her face kind of fall, you know. Okay, I said, you're welcome to come in here and join the the group that's worshiping. She said, well, um, she said, well, I, I, that's, I really need to find a meeting. And for those of you who have sorted through some of those things, you know, when she says that, I really need to find a meeting, you want to help her find a meeting. It's important. And uh, I, I just said, okay, well, um, I asked, uh, I asked if I could pray for her out there really close, right before she left. And, uh, and she, she said yes. And I know I say this a bunch too. I've hardly ever been told no when I ask if I can pray with somebody. And so I did, and, and she, she said, thank you. Uh, you've been really helpful, even though I couldn't find what I was going to. She said, maybe my partner and I, we will come back and worship with you guys sometimes. I would love that. But we, we are, again, not a museum of saints, but a hospital for sinners. That's true for this house. And in some ways, I think it needs to become true for our homes. And the way we treat people. I've been waiting for a chance, in fact, to connect this, uh, uh, this statement. Well, uh, we'll put this up in just a second. I'm going to go ahead and ask the worship team to come to the platform here as we wrap up. How many have read books by uh, Philip Yancey? Yeah, good stuff. Great writer. And so I saw this quote, and it reminded me just... You know, if we're thinking of Peter in these terms and we're okay with Peter, then how we need to become okay with all these things, uh, these concepts as well in the church. And so uh, I saw this. Can we go ahead and put that up? It says, an alcoholic friend of Philip Yancey once said to him, when I'm late to church, people turn around and stare at me with frowns of disapproval. And I get the clear message that I'm not as responsible as they are. When I'm late to AA, the meeting comes to a halt and everyone jumps up to hug and welcome me. They realize that my lateness may be a sign that I almost didn't make it. And when I show up, it proves, this is so powerful, folks. It proves that my desperate need for them won out over my desperate need for alcohol. When I read that the first time, I had a hard time with part of it. I want for people to be a part of the whole service on Sunday. And so it it has been in the past annoying to me when a significant portion of our worship group comes in a half hour or so late. And when I read that, the Lord just said, (laughs) no. No. Hmm. I hate it when he is so right. (laughs) And the worst part is, is he is right all the time. (laughs) So this whole story, our last point here, this whole story about Peter, you know, and last week it was go away from me because I'm a sinner. And this week it is you are the living God. Understanding that Christ meets us and loves us wherever he meets us. And I know there's some pushback on that. 
The only thing I would add to that, though, I think, is he meets us where we are, but he loves us enough to not leave us there. So here's a final quote here. This is, this is kind of the summary. This is, this is why I, you know, I asked you twice already what time for Easter. And, and, and even coming here, that's not, you know, that's fun. And I, I love meeting the people that you have met. But introducing people to Jesus wherever you are because of who he is, it's not Introducing people to Jesus because he is the Christ. It's like, it's not fair for us to hoard. To hoard what he's given us. And I know that there's anxiety in sharing. But in the process of vulnerable and open conversations, you will be surprised how far he takes you. And how he helps you to say whatever needs to be said. Many of us are reluctant to talk about our faith. This is a quote from Reverend Sarah Speed. But I think conviction matters. Do you believe in forgiveness? Do you believe love has the power to change lives? Do you think the world is in need of grace? If so, I want to know about it. Tell me what you believe. Ambiguity can lead to ap apathy. So tell me what you believe. That can have a ripple effect. And so in our discussions, she's speaking to her own ministry. She says, we affirm two things. Belief should not be a prerequisite for belonging in a church community. And yet beliefs matter. Statements of faith can be powerful. It certainly was for Peter. Let's stand together.